Good day, everyone. Today we are on our 16th session of Learning Basic Arthroscopy series of lectures. We have a very interesting session on all inside ACL reconstruction today. Let me just share the screen. Okay. The speaker today is Mr. Menon. He is consultant orthopedic surgeon from Kettering General Hospital. NHS Foundation Trust, which is affiliated to the University of Leicester. And we have invited faculty, Dr. Professor Ladmir Martinik from Schoen Clinic, Germany. So both are experts in the all inside field reconstruction. We also have Dr. Srinivas Kamambati, knee surgeon from Vijayawada, India, and myself, Dr. Sasinda. I'm children of knee arthroscopy surgeon from Apollo Hospital. Welcome everyone. Oh, Dr. Deepan Menu, thank you for accepting the invitation and welcome Dr. Martinik. Thank you for accepting the invitation to preside over the program. Thank you. So is it okay to start? Yes, sir. you can share your screen. Okay. Okay, so can you see me uh, now or is that yes, looking all yes, right? Yes, clear. Yeah. Okay, uh, my thank you very much for asking me to be part of this uh, program, which is on basic uh, arthroscopic uh, techniques. So I'm going to be quite basic in my presentation. I've been asked to present on the all inside uh, anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. I uh, I work as a consultant in the Kettering General Hospital in United Kingdom. Uh, there are no conflict of interest with regard to this presentation. Uh, my team has uh, changed over the years and I've had registrars and my regular anesthetists and some of my scrub nurses who are an integral part of my team. This is a brief outline of my presentation. I will initially talk on the basic science of the native anterior cruciate ligament and graft, some details of the all inside technique with my personal experience, advantages and disadvantages of this technique, some tips and tricks, and then I'll summarize and conclude. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this technique, this is a good starting point. There is a good technical description uh, of this procedure, which has been written up by uh, Wilson and his group from Basingstoke. Uh, this uh, came in the Journal of Arthroscopic Techniques in 2013, and there is a short video with this as well. But there are many other videos on YouTube, etc. Uh, the MARS revision study is important. Now, whichever technique you use to perform your anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, certain basic principles are very important. The most important of which is getting your tunnels in the right place. So this is a multi-center ACL revision study, which was commenced in 2006. The final results are expected in 2022. So this particular uh, paper, which uh, appeared in American Journal of uh, Sports Medicine in 2010, showed that a technical problem uh, occurred in about 24% of all ACL revisions. And in this group, about 80% of them were in the, on the femoral side. So I think it's worthwhile just spending some time on the native ACL functional anatomy and biomechanics. I will mainly stick to the femoral side because this is the side which is often uh, the problem. The femoral footprint has a direct attachment and an indirect attachment. Uh, these have different load sharing characteristics. So this is uh, some pictures. On the left side, you have two cadaveric dissections of the knee, uh, which show the femur and the tibia. On the right side is an arthroscopic view of the medial face of the lateral femoral condyle. And you can see here that there are direct fibers here which are oblong in shape. And these consist of very dense collagen fibers uh, which are isometric essentially. The fibers that arise from behind here are indirect fibers which go and merge into the posterior articular cartilage 
in the uh, posterior femoral condyle on the lateral side. You can see the tibial footprint here, very big ACL footprint and a smaller posterolateral footprint. The arthroscopic view shows the lateral intercondylar ridge, which was described by Clancy, and the lateral bifurcate ridge, which was subsequently described in 2007 by Freddie Fu. You can see this is the attachment of the anteromedial bundle. This is the posterolateral bundle. Now, the problem with ACL reconstruction is the conflict that arises is that the total surface area of the femoral attachment is about 3.5 times the size of the mid substance of the ACL. So you have to place a tunnel, which is approximately eight to 10 millimeters in diameter, strategically and in an optimal position to reproduce ACL function. And therefore you've got to select your tunnel in the site, which is ideal. So in this situation, most there is an evolution, but over 40 years of research has shown that this is a good position to place a tunnel, which is along the direct bundle, reproducing the anteromedial bundle if you're doing a, uh, a single bundle ACL reconstruction, because the and by doing this, you reproduce ACL biomechanics uh, fairly accurately. So if you translate this research into the graph biomechanics, the isometricity of the graft is largely determined by femoral positioning. And what I mean by isometricity is that the graft is not stretched excessively during the entire range of movement of the knee. And therefore there's a lower chance of it failing. This is an interesting cadaveric dissection. You've got two pictures here, which show the femoral condyle in full extension and in flexion. This is the view you normally see arthroscopically. You can see the posterolateral bundle, the anteromedial bundle, and you can see the ideal position of this tunnel. In the past, a lot of people were advising to go for the mid bundle position, uh, but subsequent experience suggests that it is better to go slightly deeper and slightly higher. The ACL you can see here is a complex structure. You've got the anteromedial bundle, the posterolateral bundle. Now this is in full extension. You can see that all these bundles are full, fully tight and the posterior indirect fibers are also tight. When you bring the knee into about 100 degrees of flexion, you find that the ACL has twisted on itself and this posterior indirect fibers are now lax and they've folded over. So to, the take home message here is the femoral socket is more likely to be malpositioned. You therefore have to be very careful with your drilling on both sides, but on the femoral side, you need good vision and you need good orientation to consistently drill accurate tunnels. And if you suboptimally place your tunnels, you then have increased tension in flexion loss of extension, suboptimal rotational stability, and in the long run, that accelerates osteoarthritis. Now, coming to the technique proper, uh, patient position is important. It's important to flex the knee to 90 degrees, and we use a side support, a foot support, and the anesthetists usually give a saphenous nerve block, which is good for postoperative pain relief. <coughs> As far as the portals are concerned, you've got the two portals, the anteromedial central and the anterolateral central. The anteromedial central is the viewing portal. The working portal is the anterolateral central. You drill, I mean, you, sorry, you make these portals as close to the patellar tendon as possible. <coughs> Once you've done the necessary arthroscopic procedures, which include chondral or meniscal, uh, you then harvest the graft the semitendinosus alone is harvested. The gracilis is left alone. <coughs> and after this, uh, you need a minimum of 270 to 280 millimeters of graft length, which when quadrupled will give a graft of 67 to 70 millimeters. This may vary. If you've got a taller individual, you might have to get a longer graft. The graft is then prepared over two reverse tight ropes. Uh, you use circumferential sutures. You first pass sutures through each limb of the graft and then go circumferentially two times on the femoral side here and once on the tibial side. You will note from this graft that this side appears thicker than this, but there are graft tubes that we can use to compress the graft to, to allow an interference fit of the graft into the tunnel. Once the graft has been prepared, it is tensioned to 60 newtons 
and I tend to bathe the graft in an antibiotic solution. Once this has been done, you measure the diameter of the graft as well as the length of the graft, and you take the appropriate size flip cutter. So the flip cutter two is what I use, and I get the correct diameter. There is a flip cutter guide, which has got a femoral guide, and there's, there's a separate tibial guide which, guide, which can be detached from this. On the femoral side, I tend to put my guide at about 110 degrees. On the tibial side, approximately 70 degrees. There is a step sleeve here with the step, which is about seven millimeters. And you can measure the actual distance to be traveled here. That is the width of this femoral condyle based on the reading you get here on the step sleeve once it's in contact with the bone. It's important to make a small incision here, but make sure you have your steps sleeve directly on bone. This is flip cutter two, which I use. It has got two positions, the closed position for forward drilling. The reverse drilling has an open position and you need to deploy the flip cutter. This is how a flip cutter is used. First of all, you use the guide and the uh, try and drill a pilot hole. So you've got the step sleeve. The flip cutter is in the forward position. You drill a hole forward till you're in the knee joint. You come into the knee joint at the predetermined area. Once you have done this, you remove the guide and lightly impact the step sleeve into the bone, seven millimeters. Once this has been done, you would then deploy the flip cutter and then reverse drill. And there is a marker here, which is a rubber stopper, which will give you a depth marker. So the distance that you have drilled here will can be read off here. Once you have done this, you unflip the cutter, bring it to the straight position, withdraw it from the knee, being careful not to take out this step sleeve and then pass your graft passing suture through. Now, this is an arthroscopic view of some of the sockets that have been created. You can see this is the femoral socket with a suture passer, a tibial socket, and this is your medial tibial spine with the flip cutter inside. Once you've made your sockets, you then have to pass your graft into that. And the, this is done by passing the graft through the medial portal, which you need to enlarge before passing the graft. You use the pull through sutures to pull your suspensory device such that the button comes to the outer side of the lateral femoral cortex and you then flip it. It's very important. And what I tend to do with this is I arthroscopically confirm this. I put an arthroscope in here make sure this button has flipped first. Once I have done this, then I cycle these threads and this graft is slowly winched into this socket. So you can see this has been done on the femoral side, the button's deployed, you cycle it, and then that winches the graft into the socket. The same thing is done on the tibial side. And of course the tibial socket is made slightly longer so that you can then tension your graft to the level necessary. Here you can see a graft femoral attachment on the left side, on the right side, it is in 90 degrees of flexion. And you can see this is once the graft has been fully tensioned. Here is a picture. You can see the pilot hole here. And you can see your socket. You can see the socket here on the tibial side, pilot hole and the button. Here again, this, the socket, pilot hole, button, socket, which is extending from here, pilot hole, button. <laughs> X-rays taken at one year, you can see these pilot holes and sockets much better here. There's no evidence of any socket widening. There's an MR scan of the tibial and femoral sockets, which you can see quite well. Sockets are drilled in the correct position. Now, coming to my own personal experience and observations, I find that the anteromedial central view has been a very good innovation. We can see the medial face of the lateral femoral condyle very clearly, and you don't need to hyperflex the knee. My own personal technique has evolved. I used to initially go for the mid-bundle position. Now I tend to go slightly more posterior or slightly deeper and slightly higher or more anterior with respect to the mid-bundle position. I'm able to drill sockets accurately with better control of my position, and I've not had a blowout. Tensioning is easier and can be adjusted to the level required. These are the initial series of 40 patients, which consist of my initial 40 patients, which has been published recently. 
uh, for, uh, out of this group, the uh, mean age was 27. Uh, the LISM score improved from 68.7 to 92.5. Good radi radiological positioning, no blowouts, and no graft failures in this group. So the proposed advantages of this technique are you're only using the semitendinosus. The gracilis acts as a dynamic stabilizer. If you want to use the gracilis in multi-ligament reconstruction, it is available. The quadrupled semitendinosus graft is always got a higher diameter than the four-stranded gracilis semitendinosus combination. The anteromedial central portal view, as I mentioned before, it gives unparalleled access and visibility of the medial face of the lateral femoral condyle. Inside out drilling avoids the pitfalls of creating an accessory medial portal. What happens when you hyperflex the knee with this portal is that the portal tightens, the fat pad ingresses into the knee, visibility reduces, instruments crowd, and there's a slightly higher risk of damaging the medial femoral condyle if you're not careful. Accurate socket positioning is possible, and there are various studies to suggest that, including a randomized control trial by Benia in 2014. It's bone preserving because you're using sockets instead of full tunnels, and there is emerging evidence that postoperative pain is less in this group of patients, and there are two RCTs, one by Lubowitz uh, and one by Benia. Adjustable loops allow graft tensioning right till the very end of the procedure. The disadvantages are, it's a short graft length, so you've got to plan your sockets carefully. You need to remove the ACL stump completely, and those who are stump uh, preserv preservation surgeons uh, will not easily uh, accept this as a technique. It takes longer time for graft preparation. It is useful to have an experienced uh, assistant, particularly femoral drilling. There is a learning curve and the cost of a flip cutter and suture passer will increase the cost of the procedure because it, those are two, both of them are single use instruments. Some of the tips and tricks, as I mentioned before, positioning is very important. Accurate portal placement, uh, graft preparation and compression is important to get an interference fit. You need to make sure you fully deploy your flip cutter to 90 degrees before reverse drilling. And you need to be careful when you're using the flip cutter in hard bone. And the soft tissue around the mouths of each socket need to be removed to try and avoid graft impingement. Avoid bottom out, bottoming out of the graft. So you need to measure your graft length, socket length, etc. well to avoid this happening. Otherwise, you can't tension your graft. When you're using your pull-through sutures, you try to avoid intertwining, and there are techniques to avoid that. Uh, the anteromedial central portal needs to be enlarged before graft passage, and you, of course, need to uh, properly confirm seating of the button uh, on the lateral femoral cortex arthroscopically before tensioning on the femoral side. So to summarize and conclude, it's a relatively new technique. Subjective and objective outcome studies uh, show that there are similar functional results compared to other methods of hamstring fixation. There's decreased postoperative pain uh, on two studies, and uh, there's uh, also a higher graft failure in two studies, but uh, th this has not been shown in any of the other studies and certainly has not been my experience. This is some of the relevant literature, paper by Lubowitz, 2011. Another paper in 2013, Lubowitz randomized controlled trial and some other papers. I thank you for your attention. Dr. Dipin, can you unshare? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Dipin. It was a very short and crisp presentation covering almost all aspects of all inside ACL reconstruction that any basic learner has to know. You did uh, point out why we need to choose uh, all inside ACL reconstruction, the problems with respect to placing the tunnel, especially on the femoral side, and how and why an all inside is better than a regular ACL reconstruction. You did talk about um, how to prepare the graft and the uh, steps of all inside ACL reconstruction, including having to flip the button carefully and being sure about it, and then tensioning the graft and then pulling it inside. 
you covered uh, everything about the advantages and the disadvantages and you covered about the tips and tricks of acl reconstruction it was a wonderful presentation thank you very much i am sure it has made um things clear for a lot of learners i have a couple of questions to dr deepan menon and also followed by which uh, dr martinik would like to share a couple of videos so i would like to put down a couple of questions um you were uh, you did show an image showing that uh, there is no tunnel widening after an acl reconstruction with a all inside technique um i would like to ask do we have evidence as of now whether the tunnel widening is lower in an all inside acl reconstruction do we have uh, or do you have a personal experience in towards that uh certainly i have not followed my patients to that followed up the patients to that duration to really fully know that but this group when i followed them up for the first year i tend to follow up all my acls for the first year so during that period i have not noted tunnel widening now tunnel widening by itself whether it's going to be it, it it's whether it's going to make a clinical difference that quite often many of the studies suggest that it doesn't even though there's tunnel widening it does not make a result to the clinical i mean a difference to the clinical result although if the graft fails revision may become a bit more difficult if you've got significant tunnel widening in which case you might have to do a two stage procedure but by itself tunnel widening uh, looks bad obviously on a radiology x-ray and uh, it, it but, but it does not make a clinical difference now as far as uh, tunnel widening is concerned i don't think there's any evidence currently in the literature that it's any less but one would think that if you site your tunnels properly and you don't uh, you know you you try and create a reasonably isometric graft there's nothing like full isometricity but at least reasonably isometric then the tension and the all these things like the bungee cord effect all that would hopefully diminish to some extent of course aperture fixation uh, reduces that uh, uh, you know and uh, that is something which uh, there's still debates about but this has not shown to be there's no evidence suggest currently uh, to suggest that it's any less than other techniques of okay. uh, you know of, uh, uh, fixation uh, which are cortical okay. okay as a continuation of this question i would like to ask a question which is not directly related to all inside technique do you think the adjustable loop has a lesser rate of for tunnel widening or loosening in comparison to a non adjustable loop there is some evidence but it's not you know there's none of this is level 1 evidence that's the thing you see uh, so it's it's a relatively new technique uh, there is suggestion that it's less uh, with a with a adjustable loop uh, but at the moment i don't think you can say that with a you know complete certainty uh, the uh, this particular technique certainly they have one thing they have shown is that an adjustable loop is no less strong than a fixed loop there are quite a few biomechanical studies yeah. to suggest that okay okay dr martinak do you have anything to share with respect to tunnel widening especially in relation to all inside reconstruction uh dr dr mena already said uh, everything what i would just suggest as well so i think the the biggest uh, issue is the, the proper placement of the tunnels and if you proper place the tunnels anatomically so you don't have those uh, forces there to cause any tunnel widening so in my eyes in my patients and i see about back to about 500 patients i did in the last 5 years with the, this technique so i don't see this tunnel widening significantly especially on the femoral side so you you really obtain a very good uh, press fit because you pull the, the tendon which is recompressed into the tunnel and you pull it total uh, completely into the tunnel so there is no space for for bungee jumping and and uh, so, so such uh, forces so i think um tunnel widening is is a issue of a proper placement of the tunnel so the the main issue is anatomical placement of our insertions and we will get good results yeah i think um, that makes the point very clear most of the time the tunnel widening happens when the tunnel is not in the isometric point 
like uh, Dr. Deepan Menon said in his presentation, you don't isometric. What is meant is um, the graph doesn't stretch too much in any range of motion. So when it stretches, which happens when the tunnel is not in the anatomical position, obviously there is too much stress on the edges of the tunnel. So that can lead on to tunnel widening, which is yes. what I guess. Is that right, Dr. Martinak and Dr. Deepak? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I would agree. Wonderful. Yes. Broadly, yes. I have a second question, uh, Dr. Deepak. What is your graft of choice for a professional athlete, especially a contact sport athlete? Okay, I don't use, I don't deal with professional athletes. That is not my practice. Is not to that level. I tend to be in a smaller hospital. I do semi-professional athletes. I've done okay. a few football, semi-professional football players. And I, my technique is the same. But yes, that is, I understand that there are people who tend to use, uh, you know, where you, where you want rapid rehabilitation, uh, they would tend to use, uh, you know, bone tendon, patellar tendon bone to try and rapidly rehabilitate these patients. But I have no experience of those. I, I tend not to operate on uh, professional, uh, you know, fully professional uh, athlete, athletes and football players, etc. I don't, I don't do that kind of work. Okay. Dr. Deepan, just to uh, make it more practical, what do you, I mean, to make it understand better, what do you mean by semi-professional athletes in your practice? Well, like, these are uh, people who play for the lower clubs, you know, they're not, uh, yeah, okay. yeah they, they have another job. This is yeah. not their sole earning. And, yep. uh, you know, you find the professional athletes, you need a separate insurance for that. They are very, uh, you know, it's a very highly paid profession. If you make a single mistake, you will be, in problem. So I think there are few people in, in the UK who do this. And I, if I had a professional athlete who came to me, I would refer on to those kind of, uh, you know, uh, surgeons who do the, that kind of yep. work. Okay. So here we're very okay. clear about what you do. You do what is within your own, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it should be within your level of competencies. And if it is above that level, we refer on. So, yeah. So it does, uh, I mean, the people, they do play possibly into contact sports, but they're not into like a fully professional athlete. So it yeah. still works. The technique yes, still it works. Does, it does work in those cases. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Matnik, uh, what is your choice for professional athletes? So I started to, to use quadriceps tendon and there's a new technique. So it's quite new size since a few years. So you can take quadriceps tendon without bone blocks. You obtain a tendon of 60, 65 millimeters. And uh, there's a special device, uh, uh, it, it calls um, fiber tag, and you can at attach uh, tight ropes to both ends of this tendon graft, and you can place it all inside, like you, you do it with your semi-T tendon. So in the, in the last years, I avoid to, to cut any bones from the patella, because I think patella is very important for, for all athletes, and uh, especially patella, bone patella tendon bone, this is really very invasive for for the extensive mechanism. So I uh, I was very happy that we obtained this new technique with quadriceps tendon without bone blocks. And uh, quadriceps tendon is very has a very good uh, good uh, function for for high high end athletes. Okay, Dr. Martinek, as a continuation of this question, there are two questions that pop up for me. A lot of times when we try to harvest a quadriceps graft. I mean, for us, um, we find the length of the graft is not sufficient. Uh, uh, you have never had that issue when you are not taking the bone plug, the length of the graft is sufficient? Yeah, actually, you don't need so, so, so much length. So 65 centimeter, uh, millimeters, you you will obtain in, I think, in 99% of your athletes. So, uh, it is a very small female athlete, so probably you, you will get some problems. So you have to get some more periosteum from the from the surface of the patella to get maybe some few millimeters to your graph but I, mean, I think in most of your uh, patients you can get those 60 65 millimeters of uh, quadriceps okay wonderful dr martinet and the second question i was talking about uh, by quadriceps graft you mean that you have the full thickness of the quadriceps right you you don't have to take their full thickness because quadriceps yep. tendon is very thick so I try to not to open the joint. So I may, I take like two thirds of the quadriceps tendon and this is, uh, uh, the thickness is enough for, for other purposes. Yeah, okay. 
thank you dr There's deepan special instruments you can you can harvest it i don't know if you know it in in the uk or india uh, it's from stotz it's a special instrument you can really minimally invasive harvest harvest this this tendon like 1.5 centimeters incision and you can get a tendon yep yep wonderful wonderful uh dr deepan i have a question for you and you were talking about the acl side of the all inside reconstruction and you said that you will have to remove the acl stump in order to prevent an impinging when you are pulling the graft through the tibial tunnel do you have to completely remove the stump on the tibial side certainly from around the mouth you would want to remove it and uh, you want to be very careful because if you've got a uh, significant amount of graft uh, sorry your acl tissue the native acl tissue and if it folds in while you're pulling the graft then you will find it very hard to pull the graft in and uh, my uh, that's why i tend to remove quite a bit of soft tissue from around the socket uh, i'm not sure of any techniques which uh, with which you can preserve the uh, remnant uh, but my my practice has been to remove quite a bit of the soft tissue from around the mouth of the socket okay okay uh, dr martinik uh, do you agree with that or do you have any difference in opinions no i agree with it i always remove the entire acl because for me the most important fact is the precision so if you leave some tissue there so you cannot probably have put some problems to find a the your your right position your anatomical insertion so i move everything and i also avoid the problem of of, of scar tissue and and later impingement uh, in some patients okay thank you very much dr shrinivas thank you mr menon that was a very uh, uh, very good talk uh, i just have a few questions actually so um do you have i mean i've uh, done uh, all inside acls i have found uh, the tib passing the tibial side to be a little difficult compared to the uh, femoral side um, uh, do you have any tips on um, reducing the chances of the graft getting stuck um, uh, on the uh, near the mouth of the tongue mouth of the socket right i think one of the important things is to make sure that your button as you as it goes into the uh, into your first of all through the portal medial portal itself make sure that your button is in a sort of a longitudinal plane you know it it should be uh, it should be uh, it should not go uh, and flip on the portal itself so that it should be the, you know one end of the button should be allowed to go through so you need to pull the button in carefully once you're in there you can uh, guide the button you can visualize it arthroscopically as you're pulling it and make sure that you pull on the blue sutures you know there are two sutures that you have the the lead suture and the suture that you tighten with so you pull with the blue suture that will make sure that the button goes in longitudinally into the tunnel rather than transversely if it goes in transversely then it will get stuck at the pilot hole and you don't want that so you you need to pull on the lead suture and you'll find that when you pull on the lead suture there is Uh, the uh, you know the other suture which is the uh, one that you use for tightening becomes a bit lax so you then pull that a little bit pull on the lead suture pull on the tightening suture keep doing it like that making sure that your button is sort of longitudinal in its axis rather than transverse and that way you can pull it out through the tunnel if it gets stuck somewhere all you need to do is put a probe into your uh, uh, into your joint pull on the graft pull back that will pull back on the button and then again do the same procedure which is you pull on the lead suture such that the button is uh, basically in a longitudinal plane which will make it go in easily through the pilot hole that's what i what i find about the graft um, sometimes a graft my problem is not about the button uh, yeah. if the graft gets stuck near the mouth of the socket right i have not encountered that problem because i as i say i remove all the soft tissue very carefully there because if you remove the soft tissue and you've got an interference fit if you've compressed your graft it will go in uh that shouldn't be a problem i have not i have not encountered that problem uh and i think uh, it's just a matter of uh, you know making sure that you've prepared all the soft tissue around it carefully 
Dr. Martinek, do you have any tips to share? And, uh, you have got the same opinion. So actually, you have you need a good graph master. I don't know if you prepare your graph yourself. Uh, your graph master that you really prepare very nice the ends of the graph. And then we already talked about it. We remove everything, every tissue from the tibial insertion. So you will have nothing which can impinge there. What what sometimes can happen that the, the loop is too short. So you have got a possibility to make this loop, especially on the tibial side, a little bit wider. You can you can pull it out. So you can the loop is like four centimeters, five centimeters coming from the company. So your assistant can can in, uh, make it a little bit larger. So you have got more space on the tibial side, especially for steep tibial tunnels, which where the tunnels are longer than five, six centimeters. Yeah, um, I agree with that. We have a very good assistant with us in our operation room who does this for us and makes everything simple for us because we have been operating together, Dr. Martinek and myself in the hospital. How do you, Christian, how do you uh, calculate the length of your uh, uh, graph and your uh, sorry and your sockets on femoral side and on tibial side? Are you asking me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So what I will I will yeah. So what I tend to do is I tend to drill my socket. Of course, it depends on the length of the graft you've got. Now, most of the time, your length is between sixty-seven and seventy. For a taller individual, you might go up to about seventy-five, but you don't need anything more than that. So roughly most of the time, 60, between 67 and 70 is good enough for most of the people. So what you then do is you drill your femoral socket 20 millimeters. The graft length is roughly between 20 and 25, maybe in a taller individual 30, but it's usually between 20 and 25, the graft, I mean the, sorry, the native ACL length. And then you've got your uh, femoral, I mean the tibial tunnel, which we drill to 35. So when you take the combined length of all of these three, You've got 20 on the femoral side, maybe 25 native ACL length, so it makes it 45. And then you've got 30 to 35 on the tibial side. So when you add all that up, it's between, it's roughly about 75. So you've got five millimeters of play with your graft. So your graft is about 70 millimeters. The overall length of all, all this combined together is about 75. So you can, once you tension it the first time, you cycle the knee a few times and then tension it again but you still have some space. So if you run out of that space, that becomes a problem. The graph bottoming out, then you get, uh, that can give you trouble because you then have to start again. You'll have to probably cut the buttons and uh, you know prepare the graft again, which is problematic. So you need to always make sure that the overall length of the two sockets and what you estimate the length of the ACL, native ACL to be, is always greater than the length of your graft by about five millimeters, ideally. That is my opinion. And uh, do you, uh, uh, do, what is the minimum length of the graft um, you would need to do um, all inside with a I single think you're Pushing it about 65. You can go up to about 65. Lower so than that, I have not done it. So the length of semitonosis should be uh, what will About be your 270. minimum? 270 should be the minimum length you should get. Uh, and you can go up to about 280. So between 270 and 280 is what you're looking for. And do you do exclusively all inside or do you uh, choose yes. your patient? I have started using it exclusively now because uh, results have been good. Okay. And that is my bread and butter technique which I use for everyone. I don't do this uh, you know, single bundles or uh, that kind of techniques, which uh, I, I, do, I have not, I have no experience with that. Professor Martinek, do you do exclusively all inside as well? Or? Exactly, I do it do since three years right now. And not only for primary ACL, also for revisions and also for PCL. So I think in my eyes, it's a really excellent method to to really perform all those uh, surgeries. Yeah. Regarding the graft length, so sometimes you got shorter semitendinosus and you, you will not get sufficient graft. So you can you can add a gracilis tendon. If you've got good graft master, he can include his gracilis tendon into this graft additionally to get uh, enough uh, diameter. And also 
you can you can uh, use it you know if you need more length you you can uh, take it triple not quadruple triple uh, fold it so so that you get your minimum 60 65 so these are those small tricks you can use for for your operations do you use an internal brace no and is the post operative rehabilitation the same as uh, in a conventional ACL reconstruction with the tunnels, or is, it, is there any difference uh, between the two types? What I what I find is that uh, we we tend to do uh, close chain exercises for about between four and six weeks before start commencing open chain. Any kind of sports uh, specific training at about six months. Uh, by about nine months to about twelve months, you can start training itself. And then uh, back to sport, pro probably by about that stage for semi-professional people. Uh, but I'm sure that professional people would want to go much earlier than that time frame. Uh, so that's a different thing, but I have no experience with that. So that is my method of rehabilitation. Uh, I don't brace them. I just go straight for without any brace. They fully weight bear uh, post-surgery. Of course, initially, they may just need some crutches to protect themselves uh, you know, from falling and that sort of thing. But otherwise, I tend to uh, get them onto an accelerated rehab program, uh, which means close chain for about four to six weeks, followed by open chain. Professor Martinek, your uh, uh, rehab, please. A little bit different. I, I do partial weight bearing for two weeks. I brace all patients to protect the graft. Without limits, I limit the brace for the case of meniscal surgeries, and I, I limit the weight bearing in case of uh, cartilage repair, cartilage uh, um, surgery. Uh, but actually, what I what we also use and I use in, in Germany is CPM, continuous passive motion, for, for daily use, three uh, three times daily, to, to to keep the joint moving. And uh, we also use electromyostimulation for, for about eight weeks, especially for, for professionals and for, for people who are sportive active to, to keep the muscles in, in, in charge. There are a couple of questions from viewers. Uh, Dr. Paparao has actually asked a couple of questions. Um, he's asked, uh, are there studies proving that all inside is superior to normal hamstring ACL reconstruction? Mr. Manner? I don't think there is any, I mean, we, that is too early to say that. It is no, I would say the opposite rather, that it's no worse than the other techniques which are available. Uh, it will take much more time and many more people using it before you can answer that question. That's my, my, my understanding of it. I, I also do not know any about any studies which could prove that uh, all insight is better. So, um, if I get a possibility, I could show like two or three slides of, of, of some ideas why all insight might be, might be better long term or mid term. If, 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 I don't know, Dr. Sassi, if you have got the possibility to show it. Yeah, we're waiting for it. You can, you can share it now. Can it share it now? So I go, yep. uh, I go here. So can you see it? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, you have to share screen, uh, Professor Martinez. Yeah. Yeah, multiple sharing is allowed already. Okay. Um, and now you go to the share option. Share option. Yeah. Okay. You need to click the share okay, screen option. Now you got it. Yeah. Yes, we got it. So actually, these are just few slides. Uh, about this technique. So, for uh, if, as you know, if you perform AC reconstruction and and, and aim for the femoral tunnel uh, from anterior medial, so we have got the danger of iatrogenic damage of the cartilage on the medial femoral condyle, especially for narrow notches. So, 
That's what, what you can avoid 100% using all inside. And also for the positioning of the patient, you don't have, you don't need this flexion over 90 degrees to get to the, to the uh, femoral insertion of the knee joint. The knee is just 90 degrees, 100 degrees, and you can place the femoral tunnel as uh, anatomical as possible. Um, and another advantage is uh, intraosseous healing. If you see uh, original fixation with screws, bioabsorbable screws, the titanium screws, will squeeze the raft on the, on the border of the tunnels. So you don't have this 360 degree ceiling, what you can reach using this uh, tendon, uh, tendon graft uh, fixed with, with tight ropes and uh, fixed with all inside techniques. And uh, the last slide I want to like to show, so if you do this me method properly, so you have a press fit fixation on, on both sides. So you have got less bleeding, less bleeding intra-articularly, you have got less external bleeding. And also uh, we are talking all, uh, all about biology and bone marrow stem cells, which, which will improve the healing. So those bone marrow cells will stay in the tunnel and will could or will improve the healing for, for your ground. That's what I wanted to, to add yeah. to. As yeah, as wonderful. A, uh, Dr. Martinik, we would like to see your uh, posterior graft harvest technique. Yeah. So I got not direct, not directly related to this topic, but we would like to take this opportunity to just uh, we just uh, uh, just have two minutes. This is a video uh, which is not cut, so you can really get this uh, tendon using two centimeters incision on the medial popliteal region. Um, it's a little bit difficult to keep the you have got you need an assistant who keeps the, the leg uh, up. Then you split the fascia. And uh, especially in in uh, strong patients, and who are not very who are not adipose, you can really feel the tendon right underneath the, the skin, and you 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 can harvest it. On the you can harvest both of them. You see here, this is the semitendinosus tendon. You, you you release it from the fascia. And then you, you need uh, two, special, two special strippers. Uh, one of them is, is open to strip the tendon off out of the muscle, as you see here. So as I told you, it's not cut. It takes like two, three minutes to, to get this graft. And this is also very, very cosmetic because you have uh, only skin incisions in, in front of the knee joint and in this popular uh, region. This scar is really, this is in the popliteal uh, uh, region. Uh, nobody can see it. So now you have to remove the, the muscle tissue. And then you use a, a short, rigid stripper. It's very important. This is sharp and a short stripper to strip uh, the tendon out of, uh, of the uh, piece anterior. Those are especially for the beginners, uh, harvesting of the tendon might be a little bit difficult, especially in, in people who are adipose and there's a lot, lot of fat tissue in front of the knee joint. But this method really is, is really uh, fast to learn and uh, takes you like three, four, five minutes to get a tendon. So that's it, that's what I wanted to show you. Very good, excellent. I go back. Okay. Th Thank you, Mr. Martinuk. I'm happy to say that um, I learned the all inside technique and the posterior graft harvest technique from Dr. Martinuk. So it has helped me a lot. It has reduced to it has helped to reduce the duration of surgery. And um, even in an obese patient, posterior graft harvest is quite simple because uh, uh, it happened that the posterior popliteal skin there's usually not much of fat, subcutaneous fat. So I think this is a wonderful technique. Thank you for sharing the video, Dr. Martin. There is, uh, there are a couple of 
more questions there is one question on uh, one person uh, doctor has asked to talk a few words about bungee cord effect and windshield wiper effect can you please talk about it doctor dipen so basically when you have a graft mobility within the socket or the, within the tunnel uh, which usually occurs from you know getting the graft in the wrong position in the anatomical footprint or out with the anatomic footprint then what happens is that during different uh, movements of the knee the graft is either pulled in or out which is what you call as a bungee cord effect or it is a wind shield wiper because your the graft is at different degrees of tension during different ranges of movement of the knee and that graft mobility and particularly if you don't have an interference fit between the graft and the socket then that causes a certain degree of movement with of the graft and this causes uh, tunnel widening so it's basically a mechanical phenomenon which uh, but also not fully explained mechanically but most of it can be and uh, if you hopefully get interference fit in your tunnels and they are placed in the correct position then you what one would hope that that would extrapolate to less of this kind of effect and uh, that will hopefully contribute to less tunnel widening that's what is my understanding of it smelon uh, what what in your opinion are the common causes of failure of uh, uh, you know all inside acl reconstruction or so basically with any acl reconstruction the failure can occur due to trauma itself and that's a very common thing so obviously any graft which is uh, however well you've done it if you have a significant trauma to that knee there is no reason why you can't rupture the graft the same way as you did rupture your original acl reconstruction i mean acl itself the native acl <laughs> the other is if you have a graft which is placed in the wrong position then it's constantly being cycled and tensioned more than it needs to and that can cause failure in the long run so that's another thing uh, improper placement of the grafts and uh, and of course uh, if you damage the graft uh, during uh, you know by you, while you're using the instruments or uh, while you put you know while you're uh, drilling in screws and things so like that that can also predispose to graft damage but essentially it, a combination of things it's trauma and uh, the actual malpositioning of the grafts these are the two main common causes of it so martinek what's your opinion yeah, actually the same we have got basically two two uh, possible failures one is biological failure and one is mechanical failure and i think biological failure is very seldom so we we sometimes see it the graft is perfectly placed the patient has had no no trauma and it happens but this is really only really maybe 1 2% of our patients and most of the patient in most of the patients acl will fail due to to misplacement of the graft so this is really the the most important factor of our work is is isometric and isometrical and atomic anatomical placement of of the graft and if you place it correctly you have got no impingement and no no shielding no no uh no factors we talked about like um, bumper bumper and 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 windshield effects so you will really get good results and you don't have fail there are two questions here um, one more from dr paparao uh, are there any issues with over tightening on both the ends basically i think my method of tightening the graft is normally i bring the knee to full extension this this i think is important because you don't want to lose extension if you lose extension patients are really are very unhappy so if a person's got a little bit of hyperextension provided they've got no joint laxity but if you've got slight hyperextension you try and reproduce the same hyperextension so you i tend to tension my graft in full extension but i put the put the leg in what's called as a reverse lackman position so Uh, while i'm tightening i tend to push the tibia backwards on the femur so pulling the femur forwards and pushing the tibia backwards but i try and do my graft tightening in near about full extension and by using this technique i tend not to over constrain the grafts or over over tighten them if you do it in that position obviously if you do it in a different position then you can over tighten it that's my sort of way of managing it yeah. Professor Martinez, what's your uh, yeah. view about? 
tightening the ends. Also, you, also the same, the same. I I tension the graft in extension, near extension, not over extension. If they're over extended, it would be not good. And uh, once again, if you've got good isometry and anatomical placement, the, 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 you won't have any overstretching. Uh, so I think uh, the graft can also get loosened a little bit. So if you've got good isometry, anatomical placement, you will have not this problem of, of uh, uh, extension or flexion leg in your patient. One more question was, if, if a patient does not follow proper post-operative rehabilitation, what is the chance of failure of surgery? Well, I think this is something which you've got to pick up before the operation. So if you, uh, if you have a person whom you think is not going to really uh, manage your post-op rehab program properly, then you're probably better off not reconstructing the ligament in the first place. So one of the tests for that is you probably when you you see how well they have complied with the initial prehabilitation. So, you know, when you have an injury, you're putting the patient through prehabilitation, you're putting them through physio, et cetera. You want to get a full range of movement before you attempt an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. A person who has not complied with that regime, uh, you would have to think quite hard before doing an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. You need to get back, get some feedback from your physiotherapists, find out how they have been in the you know in the prehab period if they say that this is a difficult person and the results show that then i think you really shouldn't be doing it in the first place because you will have a lot of difficulties if you uh, particularly arthrofibrosis and all these kind of things you 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 might find that these patients will develop significant stiffness and if that happens you you've done a you know you the res clinical result is probably sometimes worse than an unstable knee a stiff knee so you're probably better off selecting your patients carefully. That's what I would say. Okay. Okay. And actually, I uh, noticed uh, you mentioned sockets. Um, uh, the, the terminology used for uh, all inside ACL uh, reconstruction, they use sockets. Yeah. Uh, why do we not use sockets for the femoral side uh, of, uh, you know, when we use a... Um, uh, an adjustable loop uh, uh, endo button or an endo button. It's really a socket on the femoral side, isn't it? It is. Uh, in the it terminology is. has to be uh, because sockets definitely are different from uh, tunnel, which goes yes. right from one cortex to the other cortex. A socket is basically a blind-ended tunnel. It has got a. It, it 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 is not full. So that is what we call a socket. But on the other hand, even uh, calling it a socket in all inside may not be 100% right because we do have a 4.5 mm tunnel that is going all the way. Uh, by tunnel, they mean uh, uniform diameter of yeah, uh, yeah. four taken yeah, from one end to it. the other end. Uh, yeah, you could call it. describe socket for all inside ACL reconstruction. Yeah, the remaining part of it is called a pilot hole. So... That is what we call the other bit of it is a pilot hole, and then you have a blind end socket. I don't think the terminology matters that much, provided you don't blow out on the other side because then it becomes a full tunnel and you can't do the technique. But the bungee effect and the uh, windshield wiper effect are not seen with sockets, isn't it? For, uh, for tunnels, they are more, I think. Yeah, I, yes, that's. Uh, There's one more question from Dr. Papara. Is how often do you do ALL with your ACL surgeries? I think uh, both Dr. Menon and uh, Dr. Martinek have answered. They are exclusive ALL, uh, all inside uh, uh, ACL reconstruction surgeries. Do you do ALL at all uh, combined with ACL? I mean, the only time I've had to do, I, I don't uh, do the, you know, you might have to do something like a, um, um, you know, a lateral stabilization you can do, but unless you've got a significant pivot shift, most of the time that I find that even with a with this technique, when you've got your tunnels in the right place, you've done your meniscal repair and all that properly, you will find that uh, that generally gets rid of that pivot shift. But if you've got, of course, a very significant pivot shift or somebody who's had a uh, one of these, uh, you know, fracture of the uh, Sigon fractures and things like that with significant pivot shift, then there is evidence that doing the anterolateral ligament reconstruction uh, is something you could add on. But certainly revision surgeons 
do tend to add that on into their armamentarium. When you're revising an ACL, they would consider, uh, you know, uh, doing that lateral stabilization. Uh, I, I don't technically do that usually in my cases. I have not had the experience of doing that, but I understand that there are people who do that as a lateral, either a lateral ligament, I mean, lateral, anterolateral ligament reconstruction uh, or other techniques are there where you can use the fascia lata. Professor Martinet, do you do ALL reconstruction? And if, if you do, what technique do you not, use? Not, not in primary, not in primary for revisions. I sometimes use it. It's a, it's a rare operation, but maybe like 5% of my patients and I'm, I'm using tapes, fiber tape. This is easy method, you know, you don't add much, uh, much uh, um, and, uh, surgery uh, additional to, to your surgery and uh, you can stabilize uh, additionally, especially for revisions, because you sometimes don't know why, why do they fail? So this, this pivot, this additional pivot could be the reason for, so you can avoid it if you fix ALL. What is your graft of choice for patients with ligament laxity? It's a good well, question. <laughs> it's uh, see my in my practice, I don't deal with these. If I've got somebody with ligament laxity, I tend to refer them on because I know that graft failure rate will be very high. And uh, you can, if, if you're if you've got mild laxity, you can do certain things like positioning your tibial tunnel slightly back, you know, posteriorly. Uh, to avoid impingement, those kind of things you can try and do, some fine tuning. But if you've got somebody who's got significant ligament as laxity, then you're probably risking it by doing an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. It'd be difficult to, and I don't have much experience in that. I tend to refer on to some of the uh, tertiary centers where there are people with more experience than me in doing that. So I, as I say, I work in a smaller setup, uh, unlike Professor Martinek, who's probably in a teaching hospital. So uh, you know, he might be getting referral cases. For me, I tend to refer on the ones that are, which I feel will be technically challenging. In, in such, in such special cases, I will take what is extended because it is uh, from the quality uh, as extended a little bit better. Uh, either quadriceps tendon or in, in those really rare cases, I will, I will do some augmentation with tape to protect the, the tendon. XMAT plus plus tape as in, in form of augmentation. Yeah. Okay. I think that was a wonderful discussion. We had uh, elaborate discussions about all inside ACL reconstruction tips and tricks and uh, issues that one could follow. I think uh, we covered almost everything that uh, any basic learner or even a mid-level uh, surgeon has to know about all inside ACL reconstruction. Thank you very much for uh, a very detailed presentation, Dr. Deepin Menon, and thank you for uh, making your time for us. And Dr. Martinek, thank you very much for being available on short notice. Uh, we look forward to your presentation in future, Dr. Martinek. And I hope uh, we see you, Dr. Deepin Menon, soon in some other presentation also. Right. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. It, Thank you, Mr. it was a privilege to have you here. Thank you very much. I think it was a great day. We will Thank meet you. you soon. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Have a nice day. Have Thank, you. Day. Thank you. See you. Thank you.